Good afternoon, everyone. Today I'm chatting with Bruce Linton. Now, if you don't know who Bruce is, well, then you probably haven't been investing in cannabis stocks very long because he was the founder of Tweed, which eventually became Canopy Growth, had a market cap of over $20 billion, and was the market leader in cannabis stocks for a really long time. Now, we thought it'd be great to have Bruce on because there were big changes in the U.S. cannabis world this week when the DEA came out and said that they'd like to move cannabis from Schedule 1 to Schedule 3, which basically makes it go from being classified as if it were heroin or cocaine to being classified as if it were Tylenol. So Bruce was kind enough to hop on and give us his thoughts on what's happening in U.S. cannabis. And I also asked some questions about the state of entrepreneurship in Canada, of which it seems like is not doing so well over the last couple of years. And Bruce has some thoughts on why that is. All right, everybody, enjoy the interview. Bruce, thanks so much for joining us. Hey, man, it's uh, good to be back. Uh, I apologize as I hang out at the uh, very luxurious uh, Sheraton Toronto City Centre. Um, if people go and make a coffee behind me and stuff, uh, I think they're permitted. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, uh, we really appreciate you hopping on on short notice because there was huge news this week that uh, we've got movement towards the U.S. rescheduling cannabis from Schedule 1, which puts it in a category like uh, heroin and cocaine, to Schedule 3, which puts it in a category like Tylenol. Now, I know that you've been thinking about these things and having these conversations and investing and running companies in cannabis. And this has been something you've been probably watching uh, at a very, very uh, focused level for years. What are your thoughts on the news from this week? So my reaction was I was an aggressive seller. So like I, I set a limit on any positions I had, uh, anything that had cannabis in the name, I was selling. You say, whoa, why would you be selling it? Um, because my theory is that uh, what they've done is say it's less criminal to grow, move, transport, and sell cannabis than it was before, which when things become less criminal, uh, less challenging, and there's a heavy tax rate on the uh, non-criminal ones, I think you're going to see more uh, illicit activities. Second reason I was a seller is I believe if you ask everyone in America and every politician in America, what do they think this means and what is the federal government going to do around regulating cannabis, you would get like 300 million plus different answers. And the reason is, I have, don't think anyone knows what the federal government, are they going to do state rights next and allow you to only do what the state wants to do? Are they going to have interstate commerce? Like, are you going to be able to take that Tylenol across the country now? Or does it have to be a Tylenol produced in your own state? And there's, uh, what are they going to do about medical? Is medical going to be truly medical? Is it going to be end of the Walgreen? Like, what, what is the U.S. actually going to do to regulate things other than make it less criminal? And, and so I think there's, there's all kinds of potential but I don't know that it's only upside. I think that there's, uh, we're in a weird zone, right? I've spent a lot of time over the last four years helping with an organization that has support and funding from like the Michael J. Fox Foundation and a number of others. And um, what we're trying to do is make the definition written out of what the public policy should be to regulate. Because the worst thing any government in the world can do is decriminalize. You say, well, why, why is that terrible? Well, when you decriminalize it, you still haven't regulated it. So you don't know that anybody's testing the product. Is it clean, safe? Is it available? Is it what they said it is? It just means that criminals don't have a problem now. The regulated people have a system. And, and so like, I, I'm way more excited about what they're doing in the Netherlands right now, where they're taking away the illegal supply and making their own production. It's going to be a very big market. And it starts like June 17th. It's getting bigger. In September 17th of this year, that Dutch market is going to get really big for the legal suppliers. They're going to have like hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue land in their lap because the suppliers are getting pushed out the door. That, that to me is way more exciting than America might make a system, but we don't know what that means. So, so you're still a big believer in the European opportunity for cannabis operators? I, I'm a big believer in regulated markets. Um, so... The Netherlands is moving to that. You used to just, you know, just so people get it, like the Netherlands is the most hilarious public policy in the world. As far as I can tell, it's essentially public policy that if it was turned into an animal, it would look like a platypus. And, and like platypuses to me are just, they're hilarious. 
right? Like they can sting you. They lay eggs. They got like beavers featured, duck features. I just think they're like public policy done wrong. And so what the Netherlands was, is that it was okay to sell cannabis. It was okay to buy cannabis. It was okay to buy cannabis seeds. It was okay to have uh, seeds produced, but it was illegal to produce cannabis in the country. So all the cannabis that was sold in the Netherlands officially came from nowhere. That's pretty unusual. So you can, it comes from nowhere. And so it was very good for like, say, bike gangs in British Columbia, maybe some folks in Albania, perhaps some Vietnamese exports, but it came from nowhere. So they were supporting criminals by allowing you to buy their product as long as the criminals got it in okay. Now they're saying, no, you're going to produce it in our country. You're going to sell it in our country and we're going to regulate it. And we're going to test it. And, and that's going to be the business. So I like regulated. I think Germany's going kind of half the wrong way. They're kind of saying it's not criminal, but we don't really have a supply chain. Do you think that the, I don't know if you want to use the term black market or gray market or whatever term. Uh, I like, I like the word use. illicit, illicit. Okay. The, okay. Um, if, if you, um, if you say, well, why do they call it the black market? I think there are racist specific reasons for that. I think the illicit market is a, a, a more appropriate and, and better uh, word. Okay. So the illicit market in Canada, um, now I just know this from personal experience, uh, friends of mine who buy cannabis products, they say that they go to these websites that don't have any licensing. Uh, and they go there because the pricing is far, far cheaper. They can get uh, a lot more cannabis products uh, for their dollar than they can if they go to the local licensed yeah. store in Canada. Do you think that this is a big problem for Canadian cannabis operators? It, it, it is. And it's the most easily solvable problem on the planet for the government. So why is it expensive to buy the legal stuff? Because more than 50 cents on every dollar is taxes. Like as a starter, the federal uh, excise tax was supposed to be 10% of the sale value from the producer into the system. And somebody somewhere in a bureaucracy said 10% equals $1. So now when you're a, a producer and you're selling product at two, three dollars a grand into the system, four bucks, one dollar of that is taxes. And then the provincial tax and the markup by the provinces for the sales. So like Deloitte did a study that I think now more than 50%, 50 cents on every sale dollar is federal taxes. That should be more like 10 to 15% of the sale price. And all of a sudden it would be very difficult, not beneficial for the illicit market to participate. And so this is a tax thing, not more police thing. Interesting. I'm not sure if you're involved with any U.S. cannabis operators. Uh, it sounds like you 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 you, you trade them. Uh, I imagine for some of the deals that you've been involved in, that you still have positions from your uh, original involvement with the companies. But do you think that the news that we got this week is going to pave the way for these U.S. cannabis operators to be able to go and list on a U.S. big board? Um, I, I think it's an election year. And there's going to be lots of exciting announcements, which will be, you know, today, I haven't looked at the socks, but it's probably a good day to be buying them because maybe by next Tuesday, another politician is going to make another positive announcement. And so in the election year, I think there's going to be promises made. We'll see how they do at keeping promises after the election. So Bruce, I'm going to get away from cannabis for a second and just sort of talk about your background in the Canadian junior markets. You, the, um, Canopy or Tweed wasn't your first rodeo with the Canadian junior markets. And um, uh, at the risk of getting a little political here, um, I kind of look around at what's happening in Canada and the junior markets where things have dried up. It seems to me as a young-ish person, uh, when I look around my network and I go to events, I'm not seeing, it feels like I'm not seeing a lot of entrepreneurship that's happening out of Canada. The companies that we do see get listed aren't seemingly working out well. Some of them, uh, you know, during that, uh, speculative bull run that we saw in 2021 did raise lots of money and didn't really produce a whole lot in the end. Most of them are now back to being, you know, we're near, near worthless penny stocks. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious for, for, for hearing it from your perspective, somebody who actually built a cannabis company from the ground up as an entrepreneur, got it up to, I don't know what it was at its height, over a $20 billion market cap, I think. Yep. And uh, so so you've kind of went through the process, had the success. Uh, do you, do you, when, when you look around today at the Canadian junior markets and the state of entrepreneurship in Canada, do you think that things are fundamentally broken and there's things we could do to 
foster entrepreneurship at a higher level in Canada? I think really I would put things into three buckets. So the, the first bucket is I think most people who are entrepreneurs or many of the ones that I know um, are, are actually reasonably unemployable people because they don't want to take direction constantly from others and they want to, they would sooner fail at their own hands than succeed under somebody's direction if, if it's possible they could lose their job and, and they're worried about that. So they're, this idea of uh, an entrepreneur, occasionally somebody's super smart and they think of Google. But like a lot of times it's incremental things. And so you really just, you want to be on your own. And you want to start your own business. I, I think that's almost frowned on. Like it looks like, you know, if you, if you, if you have that sort of behavior, um, we now try to medicate you or we try to get you to be more compliant. So I, I think people should be encouraged if, if they are, in fact, um, a bit of a, a boss kind of person and, and they don't want to have payroll privileges taken away, start your own thing, should be viewed as societies. Uh, that's good. And I don't know that we applaud that right now. Like, why can't you get a job with the government groups? Well, not only do I not speak French, I would probably kill people in the first week. Um, but we don't, we don't necessarily as a society say that's terrific. Try it. If you fail, get back up and try again. And that's more American, more like Hong Kong, China. Second thing is I find when, um, interest rates are relatively high and people can make money by doing nothing, right? Just allocate and you can make your, your juicy uh, returns. There's not a, there, why would you put money at risk when we've had a 20 year cycle where we had to because there were no interest rates? So I think being an entrepreneur is particularly hard until we actually go back to a cycle of, uh, you know, lowish returns. And the third thing is we're in an environment globally where we're, I started cannabis not because I thought cannabis should be for everyone. I thought that the government was going to change the rules because the police hated the rules and Mr. Harper liked the police. And I was right. Um, what are the big trends that we can see happening globally? Like there's the world's trends. You know, we had a brief minute where we all thought we had to do, um, you know, uh, something to do with no, no carbon and ESG, but that cycle was super short. Like what's the trending point now? Uh, maybe hydrogen, but like, I don't see a specific food strategy or something jumping out. And so most entrepreneurs tend to, I think, um, go after a market that's shifting or expanding. And I can't tell you which markets are shifting or expanding easily because everybody just wants to talk about AI. Right? Like, oh, good. Like, I don't even invest in AI. People say, why not? So one of my investing rules is that if I had to, I can fire the CEO and do at least as bad as they did because I comprehend the topic. If we do that on AI, if I fire the AI guy, like I'm, I'm going to be, you know, pretty sure to be at least more incompetent than the guy I fired, unless they were a criminal. And so, um, you know, you need to know where your swim lanes are, and I, I just don't see any big shifting trends, markets flipping upside down, and you grabbing it right now. So, speaking of being an entrepreneur or an investor and trying to figure out where those trends are and where you want to be. I think that a good way to this, this is a good way to segue into what have you been up to lately? I, I, for a long time, we'd, we, we, we'd see your name popping up, being involved with various companies. And I feel like I, I haven't seen Bruce Lytton's name, uh, in, in the media much lately. Well, so when I got fired, uh, that's like, it's coming up on, uh, five years. And so what I did is I had 11 companies right away that I either put money in or they gave me a bunch of stock to help them make them better off. And like all but two of them either got bought or went public and I didn't have to do anything anymore. So now I've got two left and uh, I'm helping a third one. And so I've got um, pretty active right now with a company out of uh, Florida called Miami Cocktail. And um, I like it because I invested because the product was good, but then I um, started helping them a bit and we haven't announced, but we have a humongous super appropriate celebrity who signed on with us who happened to have the exact same lawyer as Martha Stewart, who we did a really good deal with. And so the deal I did with Martha, what we did with this one is rather than them getting a percentage of our revenue or profits, which eventually make us at the bottom line look worse than we are without them, um, why not get them to have equity and invest, but also get more than they paid for? So they want us to succeed. So their equity goes up. And so that one, um, uh, shipments just started going to Walmart in the US and it's starting to rip. So Miami cocktail, I like that one. It's smart. Um, just trying to help a company from Western Canada list on uh, NASDAQ and they should be listed in about two weeks. They're stepping through a SPAC process. So, you know, anybody who's listening to this knows that when you list with a SPAC, you can either go up or down in price. Most go down for a while because a whole bunch of the stock comes flying in and then you find out if it's a good business or not over the next 12 months. 
that one is called uh, Above Foods. And I think I would probably watch it trade. And if it traded down, I think it's a pretty good company that has about 300 million US in sales and can have a lot more. Um, so that one's, that one's been interesting. But once it lists, you know, uh, I'm out. Is your um, entrepreneur brain still kind of operating whenever you go places and you experience new things and you see trends that are happening? Is is there a part of you that's like, oh, there's an idea? And uh, yeah, hundred percent. I, I don't know how if 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 you go out and and travel and not just in America. Like I have a couple other places I want to get this uh, winter and fall. I find when you see things, it's like all kinds of new inputs, but you, you blend them up differently because you're coming from a different perspective. Like if you sit at home and say, well, I'm just going to read the news and come up with a business idea. I don't know how you do that. Like, I think you have to blend the news. Plus you have to blend actually getting out and, and bumping into people. And like, when you start talking to people, there's a, a baseball game on, when did they play? Monday. And uh, the guy who was sitting near me, um, I get talking about this whole new system that they're trying to implement for um, managing electronically passports and how it's done in other countries and how it could be done better here and how come we're better than other places. I learned like a ton about passports and, and controls on them. How will I use that? I don't know. But like that input, you build on it when you meet somebody else who has another thing and you may loop back. So I, I think it's super important to get out and chat with people. Last question for you, Bruce. I know you're busy, but... Uh... We, we had our, 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 our pre-interview staff meeting and uh, one of uh, our, our staff wanted to ask you this. Are you willing to throw a name out there as your favorite U.S. cannabis stock? So disclosing my, uh, I own some of the one I like and I wasn't pushing it hard to sell compared to some of the others. I really like uh, Terrasense. You say, well, why do you like them? And the reason is that they're very tightly held by the principal operator, Jason Wild, is fine. Um, they've done really smart things in terms of cleaning up their, their cash costs and balance sheets and, and profitability. They don't appear to like be on the hook to uh, IRS. They're paying their taxes, to my understanding. And uh, he's in some good states. Um, I just think he's going to be one of the solid ones that didn't get too big, didn't get too small, plays up the middle and and... and if the rules change, I think he's probably as well or better positioned to go bigger. Um, so that I, I tend to like uh, Terrasen for that reason. I hold a bunch of it. Um, but um, the rest, you know, I, you, you can't look, can't look past Cura Leaf because I think they get the global play, right? They're not, they're the only U.S. player that has a fully comprehensive strategy and are entering the European markets as, as well. And, and I think that's going to be part of their total growth. Um, and I think it's because they have a guy named Boris running it. And, you know, when your name is Boris and it sounds kind of Russian at the, the last name, you probably have an understanding of Europe that might be different than if your last name is like something super American and you don't even have a passport. So, like, I think he's, he sees the global play. Um, I just don't, I think I find they're reasonably highly valued for everything else, you know, when you compare a dollar of revenue to the market cap, et cetera. Yeah. Well, Bruce, I know you're a busy guy. We really appreciate yeah. uh, appreciate you hopping on here. Um, it's cool. uh, something our audience is really going to enjoy. And uh, hopefully you'll keep coming back on here as uh, this story continues to develop. And uh, thank you so much for your time today. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. See you later. Bye. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this interview, please smash that like button, subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Also, let me know what you think of the comment section. Thanks, everyone.